perhaps we have ourselves. For some of us, in the surrender that comes after very bad news, we find that we are finally able to let go and be present in the moment. Letting go of the fear, the anger, and, gradually, the things that bind us into our lives, we are set free. Serenity to accept the things you cannot change often comes after having had the courage to change the things we could. It takes courage and humility to open new doors and to close old ones. For many of us, courage is not something we came into the room with, but we find it here. We might still be afraid, but that no longer stops us from showing up and meeting challenges head on. When we walk through our fear, our fear turns into faith. Ultimately, this chapter is all about courage. The courage to accept the things we cannot change and to change the things we can. To look at ourselves as we are and accept ourselves anyway. To talk about things that make us uncomfortable and to take on some of the issues that challenge us most deeply. Working a program in relation to the physical part of our recovery does not necessarily mean working a physical program, though for some of us it does. We don't all take on exercise or proper eating or conscious physical being as part of our daily program, though some of us make this a central part of our recovery. The principles are what we share when our practices are very different. We all find that it is necessary, sooner or later, to face the truth about our bodies, whatever that might be, to address the harm that's been done, to treat what we can, and surrender the rest, and to be honest. What we gain is acceptance of our physical reality, the ability to live as fully as we are able, and the willingness to do so, on life's terms. Living Clean Approved Draft for Decision at WSC 2012 Relationships R. Recovery doesn't happen in a vacuum. We need one another, and we need to be involved with the world around us in order to recover. All about relationships with ourselves, with our loved ones, with our fellow members, with society, and ultimately with our higher power. The people in our lives are the means by which we experience grace. We see the miracle of change in others, and they reflect our own changes back to us. They are windows through which we see the world, and vehicles by which we achieve spiritual progress. The truth is that most of us have not been very good at relationships. Some would say that an inability to form or maintain long-term relationships is one of the symptoms of addiction. The basic text tells us that the disease makes us devious, frightened loners, that we develop strange habits and lose our social graces. When we came into recovery, we didn't always recognize what was wrong with the way we related to people. Our experiences of using addicts shaped our habits and our expectations. We have not been easy people. We do harm when we are using, and the people who are closest to us get the worst of it. We can be stubborn and suspicious, angry and afraid, sarcastic, willful, and set in our ways. We have been through hell, and we have put others through hell, too. We've experienced loss and failure and often violence. Even if we come in with families or careers intact, we need to change how we deal with them. Gaining these skills in recovery can be a long and sometimes painful process. When we look back on our act of addiction and see the harm we caused, the relationships we destroyed, and the opportunities for intimacy we threw away, we may be overwhelmed by the wreckage. But we can also find some gratitude for the fact that we are clean now and we are changing. Our history 
history with relationships can lead us to think that there is no hope for us in this area, but our experience with the second step proves to us that we can be restored to sanity. We need help that our loved ones cannot give us. The therapeutic value of one addict helping another really is without parallel. Caring and sharing the knowledge is the ultimate weapon against our alienating, isolating, destructive disease. Serious work is required. The issues we need to deal with emerge in the course of our interactions with others in and out of non. As we go about our lives, just being who we are, we begin to heal. While we are healing, we experience difficulties and conflicts. When we no longer have the drugs to blame, we begin to understand the part we play in our own struggles. When we see ourselves creating wreckage while clean, we have a harder time making peace with ourselves. Some of the struggles we believe that lasting change is possible. Members who care about us will help us to see the ways we are still creating our own problems, but it's our responsibility to do something about it. We learn to share, and share intimately. For many of us, sponsorship is our first honest, functional relationship, at the very least, the first in a long time. Sponsorship we serve as a model on which we begin to build other relationships that are healthy, loving, and productive. Many of our longtime members recall that they were impossible, newcomers, questioning, doubting, arguing, and admitting their reservations. We made mistakes in public in Dell. 66. Chapter 5. Relationship 67. With the consequences. We built our foundation not by pretending, but by going through the struggle honestly and courageously, and accepting help along the way. Recovery is not always a tidy process. We are building intimate relationships with other people and with a power greater than ourselves, and neither of these comes naturally to all of us. We don't all come into not alone. Many of us come into recovery with partners, children, parents, and others we are close to. But many of these relationships have been damaged by our disease. As we recognize that we can't fix it all at once, it can be tempting to just walk away. But relationships are not like drugs. Even though we may have used them for the same purposes, we can't simply abstain. The real work of living clean happens when we are in the world, relating with others. Our only choice is to learn as we go. We learn to deal with our family, our workplace, and our community at the same time that we are learning to find our place in the room. Each relationship we have affects every other. Each one teaches us things that help in the rest of our relationships. We don't get long-term recovery without having relationships, both in and out of the room. It's the meat and potatoes of life, and the dessert. Relationships affect everything we do and everything we are. The ways we respond to our experiences shape who we become. When we are willing to stay in recovery, to allow ourselves to grow and change, we experience a full range of emotions. That we get clean at all is a miracle. But it doesn't stop there. We grow to be steady, reliable, loving people who can be a force for change in the lives of other addicts and beyond. Relationships are central to everything we do. There is no separate tradition that is not somehow about relationships, and all of our literature talks about relationships in some way or another. There is no other area in our recovery that causes us more pain or more joy, it's where we see our growth and our recovery.
screens clearly. Fellowship. When Na began, the simple idea that addicts could recover in society, rather than having to be removed from it for long periods of time, was radical. For many of us today, what is revolutionary about our recovery is the love and intimacy we experience with other members. We come together in fellowship. As we stay together, we find in one another a deep affection and trust that can override the hurts and squabbles we have along the way. The ties that bind us together are also the roots that nourish our growth. When our first surrender happens in the arms of Na, there is a connection that is made between the suffering addict and the fellowship. We know from the beginning that Na is our lifeline. When something else brings us ashore, we may not know that as clearly. It can be frustrating when we need to teach someone that Na is not an extended aftercare program or a treatment theater. We need, and 
and it happens in the exchange between virtual strangers and our meeting. This is nothing short of a miracle. Over time, we learn that we have a safety net we can trust, and we can rely on the people who care for us to carry us through. Relationships are one area where we show our differences most sharply. Some of us stay pretty isolated, while others are surrounded by people. Some of us develop large and vibrant social circles within the fellowship, while others of us have just a few friends we are comfortable with. Some of us find that in recovery we calm down in all kinds of ways, while others are still partying, still gone, but doing it clean. Some of us stop dating when we get clean, and others go a little wild. There is probably no area of recovery where we offer more advice, or take less of it. But the things we all have in common across the fellowship have little to do with any rules or advice, they have to do with the nature of our disease, and the tools we use to address it. What we share is the disease of addiction and the principles of recovery that can guide us in all our affairs. There are some things that apply to all of us. We have a disease, and the core of that disease is self-obsession. The most important tool we use in fighting our disease is empathy, the sense that others understand us in a deep way, and the concern we feel for others that allows us to get out of ourselves and connect to something greater. Empathy means we get each other. We see the hidden darkness and love and hurt, and we understand. That is different. Living clean approval graph for decision at WSC 2012. Chapter 5, Relationships. 69. From brutal honesty, taking the truth about someone and using it as a weapon to hurt them. Empathy is not emotional violence. We might hand one another the truth on a plate, unavoidable, obvious, terrifying, and maybe also kind of funny, but we don't use the truth as a means to gain power or humiliate. We show one another through our insight an example that we have a better self, and that we can rise to it. The things we complain about most in the fellowship are often the challenges from which we learn the most. As much as we would like to imagine that we would learn to practice spiritual principles by reading about them, we learn what they mean and how to apply them by bumping up against each other, sometimes wealthy. Sometimes simply not escalating a conflict can be a success. It may not be within our power to make peace, but we can certainly keep a situation from impacting the newcomer or the atmosphere of recovery we all treasure. Many times we have seen members who actively dislike each other set aside their differences to help a newcomer, or at the bedside of a sick friend, or at a moment of distress. The life and death struggle we experience and bear witness to put everything else into perspective. The conflict, the drama, and the breakups in the room help to wear away our rough edges. We learn to deal with each other in spite of our feelings and our history. The intensity of fellowship is what brings us from our condition as isolated, alienated, and frightened addicts to loving, caring, and sharing members of NOS. When we are in the middle of the worst kind of conflict, we may struggle to remember that we are still welcome in meetings, that we still have people whom we trust and who care for us, and that we are still very much in the middle of the fellowship and of our own recovery process. That when we have a genuine need or concern, almost any member will reach out to help, even if there has been some unpleasant history between us. We start to believe that we are safe. Oh, 
over time, as we care for people and see that they really do support us, we start to feel a little safer. You can be a little more willing to take a risk, let go of what's not working, and try something different. Each time we make ourselves vulnerable and find someone there for us, we come to a new level of safety and trust. We often tell newcomers we will love them until they learn to love themselves. What we are doing is loving one another back to life. That's true no matter how we express that love. Some of us are warm and affectionate, some of us are gruff and removed. But what we do in the room is when a meeting is happening is the same. We are turning our attention outside ourselves and making a new kind of connection. The basic text tells us that love is the flow of life energy from one person to another. This is essential to what we do. We connect with others, and through them, to a power greater than ourselves. Opening up to the world around us is a spiritual awakening. One of our earliest connections and recovery is mutually with a home group, whether we call it that or not, a meeting we connect with and attend regularly.
coming back anyway. As our respect for ourselves grows, we choose more carefully who we confide in. We get to know each other better, and we also get a better idea of ourselves and what we want and deserve in our friendship. We begin to recognize the elements of a healthy relationship. A sense of safety can be the biggest difference in our relationship. We start to feel like we can trust people, and we become more trustworthy ourselves. Our third tradition teaches that we are all accepted and not. We are not going to be thrown out if we make a mistake. So we get to experience different types of relationships and different kinds of conflicts, safe in the knowledge that we will still be welcome when it's over. One of the things we notice in recovery is that we have many different kinds of friendships. We get to experiment with that, too, and find the ways we are most comfortable connecting. Those also change over time. Relationships are fluid, and that is part of what makes them so challenging. They change all the time. A member we have sort of known for years will ask us to copy and we become fast friends, or we notice that someone we once were close to has thrown away from us and we no longer seem to have as much in common. Our expectations about Buddha, living clean approval graph for decision at WSC 2012. Chapter 5, Relationships. 71. Friends should be or what a partner, a sponsor, or a parent should be, to keep us from addressing the reality of our relationships. We let go of the things that cut us off from other people and from ourselves. Steps and traditions help us learn how to practice principles, and to clear away the mess that makes it so hard to see what is real. There were parts of me that were broken because of my childhood damage, explained one member. I made a decision that no one would hurt me again and I would rely only on myself. It created a very lonely world. There wasn't room for anyone else not even my higher power. It took some serious step work to recognize how my early relationships set the pattern for later ones. The core of our disease is self-obsession. It needs to be dealt with from the very beginning of our recovery and for the rest of our lives. We begin to learn this the first time we walk into a meeting and feel we are in the right place. The identification we feel, the sense that other people know what we have suffered, breaks the grip of that self-obsession and frees us from ourselves. Escaping the trap of self-centeredness opens us to others, and we are startled by their gifts and their uniqueness. We are each stronger in some ways and weaker in others. We find that we are able to help and be helped by the same person. They need what we have, and we need them as well. We awaken to a world where no one is simply what we think they are. Everyone has stories and struggles, assets and shortcomings. We can learn from anyone and everyone. Escaping from cycles of victimization, blame, and shame allows us to see how many other ways we are connected to the people around us, even those we don't yet know. The gifts of recovery are available to us all, and they come through us all. We feel one another.